and good morning. How's everybody doing today? Uh, first, uh, I wanted to mention, uh, you know, I've taken this trip yesterday to teach a class in uh, the Colfax area to some up-and-coming ministers. Uh, I'd asked for prayer. Everything went just about as smooth as could be. Uh, you know, driving my little sports car, which is not a snow vehicle. Um, and as I climbed up the mountain, uh, it was about 32 degrees around Truckee. You know, so if any moisture, it could have been a uh, hairy ride. Uh, but it was fine, made it over. Uh, funny thing, smoke all the way up there. There was a turn or two where I could hardly see around the corner, but it cleared up quickly, so it was, you know. The very top of Donner was actually clear, about five miles in each direction. Crystal clear, blue skies, reflecting water, the, the rest area up there, the lake next to it. Five miles over the hill, smoke. Uh, earlier in the week, I'd called Lori, who lives in the church administrator, lives at the conference center area, and we were talking about the logistics and working things out. And she said, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there's fires in the area. We're well aware of the fact that there's fires in the area. Um, there's smoke everywhere. And then just to show her, I walked outside here. I took a picture of the street. This was Wednesday or Thursday or whatever. And my camera flashed a message. So I took another picture and it did it again. It said, please clean your lens. It interpreted that much smoke as a smudgy, dirty lens. That, that's some smoke when your camera's telling you you need to clean your stuff up. That is some smoke. Anyway. Uh, that was the biggest thing. I know we have a few things to announce. Uh, prayer Monday. When is Prayer Monday? Well, Out of Town Park. This Monday? Yes, and, and I'm trusting that those two raindrops showing up on the weather report will not happen. Yeah. Well, yeah. Here's the good news. Generally, when it says it's going to rain around here, it doesn't. Or there's only about six drops. Unless you plan something. That's the bad news. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, other things that need to be mentioned? Well, then. Oh, Amber. Uh, tell us, yeah, you want to talk, tell us real quick about the first official MOPS meeting? Yeah. Yeah, the first official MOPS meeting happened on Tuesday. All right, we had our first official MOPS meeting on Tuesday. I quickly just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, the support from this church has been amazing. Um, Dana's kids, Mops Kids, continues to grow, but if you are available to hold a baby and to love on them, she could use even more help. The more help Dana gets, the more moms we can help. So um, we just spread the word. If you have a friend that's at home, they're retired, and they want something to do, we need help. Um, also, um, just I just want to say thank you to all the women that have been up front with the moms, for George, who does things in the back, and Pastor, um, and who are willing to support dads, and to all of, there's like so many of you that are just behind the scenes. Um, I want to thank Gwen for doing all the finances and enrollments, and Ray, and Phil, and Terry, and there's more, Catherine, the list goes on, and none of these people get credit throughout the, you know, meeting time. Also, I mean, almost the rest of you guys are probably doing Mops Kids, so thank you. We just appreciate the love and support, and we hope that this ministry will really change our community, um, just allowing for moms to feel loved and supported. All right. Thank you. All right. Let us let's praise the Lord our God, for he is worthy. Good morning. Good sounds a new beginning as distant hearts begin believing 
Christian did his unrelenting. Your love goes on. Your love goes on. Carry us, carry us when the world gives way. Cover us, cover us with your endless grace. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Time is up for chase and shadow. Gave the world a light to follow. Hope that shines beyond tomorrow. Your love goes on. Your love goes on. Carry us, carry us when the world gives. Way. Cover us, cover us, your endless grace. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. darkness breaking every chain you set us free fighting for the furthest heart you gave your life for all to see tearing through the veil of darkness breaking every chain you set us free fighting for the furthest heart you gave your life your love is relentless It's really amazing, and it's really wonderful, the outreach we have from this church. And we might not all love the internet and all of the things that come with it, but what we do is we touch people who aren't going to be touched in any other way. And as a rule, I don't just mention a one prayer request from the pulpit. However, we, we did have a gentleman on Facebook that asked for prayer for a friend whose life is falling apart. And I know that many of us know what it feels like when your life begins to fall apart, even for a short time. And I saw a situation in a grocery store yesterday that broke my heart and I didn't know what to do. And I thought, Maybe this young woman would be watching our service this morning, and I might say to her right now, I saw you yesterday and couldn't act, but if you need help, the Methodist Church is here for you. Just be aware of how far your reach is, how far our reach is. Go with me to prayer right now. Lord God, you heard those concerns. You know our concerns. You know each of us better than we know ourselves. 
You know our hurts, you know our thoughts, you know our dreams. You know where we stand up, you know where we lay down. God, I do pray that you would be with this gentleman who's in need, whose life is falling apart. Pick up the pieces for him, Lord, and bring him back together. Let him know, let him feel prayer right now, feel your hand. Touch this young woman. You know the situation, and it wasn't good yesterday, and it's not good today. And I can assure you, God, I know it's not good tomorrow. If she is watching this service today, help her to reach out. We have a prayer chain, Lord, that we know reaches your very ears. Thank you. Thank you for being here for us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.
God Almighty reigns. Alleluia. separate them now. I won't be able to later. Well, close enough. So as I mentioned, I had the privilege and honor to teach this class to up-and-coming ministers yesterday. Six hours class, we had a break or two, of basic Christian core doctrine, which leads to some questions. What are the basic Christian core doctrines? Some people have a list of five. Some people, uh, I actually had the students look at four different videos. And in it, each YouTube clip or whatever it was, it was a John MacArthur, Hank Hanegraaff, uh, Alan something. Uh, 
And they had their little five-minute videos on basic Christian core doctrines. They were not the same list. They were not in the same order. However, you could tell that some were pretty common across all of the four videos. So now I have the job of trying to come up with a basic Christian core doctrine. I thought about the, some of the major fields of study, which you never need to use these words, but there is uh, Christology and Bibliology with a capital B. Uh, bibliology with a small b generally refers to the study of books in general, but capital B, the study of the Bible. I did soteriology, eschatology, ecclesiology, hamartology, um, and a few other ologies you know, along the way. And, uh, and then I realized, you know, I've just I got like six hours of material here, you know. If you guys aren't doing anything after lunch, we're going to go through all six hours. How's that sound? Yeah. Okay, okay. We're not going to go through all six hours of it. But there are a few things I wanted to share. Uh, and then, you know, more, more, normally I like to take a large passage of Scripture and go through it, a chapter, a, you know, a topic, stay on context. Each verse builds on the next one. When we're studying a major topic or theme, you don't go to one chapter. You need to see the whole panoramic view. So if we're going to talk about what sin is or what sin does, you need to look at a lot of passages that have the word sin in it. Or if you want to look at you know, uh, <clears throat> passages about uh, you know, how, many, how, how often is the Old Testament quoted. You've got to go through and see all the different places of the Old Testament. You know, you have to, it's a more uh, larger view. Well, today I want to talk about Christology, the study of Christ. Uh, it comes from the Greek word Christ, which I've told you before, but uh, uh, <clears throat> just again, for those at home, new people, the word Christ means anointed or christened, which is where the word Christ comes from. It's from the Hebrew word Messiah, which means like an anointed one. So Messiah, Christ, christened, anointed, similar term. And so an ology comes from the Greek word logia, which now is used to mean the study of. So Christology, the study of Christ. Well, how would you do that? Well, you'd have to go through the Bible and look at most everything he said to really get a big picture of who Christ is, what he said, what he did, what he And Christians have been doing this for some time. Now, who is Jesus? Uh, this was from gotquestions.org. They report almost every religion teaches that Jesus was a prophet or a good teacher or a godly man. Uh, and it says here, the problem is the Bible tells us that Jesus was infinitely more than a prophet, a good teacher, or a godly man. What is, and here's, a, here's another fun big word, what is the uh, hypostatic union, hypostatic union of Christ? Another big churchy theological word, but the argument comes, and it's happened over the centuries. How much of Christ is God? How much is human? Because he was certainly human. He could be punished and hunger and all sorts of things, thirst, you know. He, he, uh, and of course, he was of God, performer of miracles, fulfillment of prophecy, and all these things. And there have been arguments that, you know, maybe it's a, a 60 40 or 70 30 split. Maybe there's two natures at work, the God nature and human, and they kind of wrestle back and forth. Uh, one, I think it was in Nestorianism, don't quote me on that, uh, had had him being a full spirit being, and that anything he did was kind of a hologram or a projection of the spirit in the physical. He really wasn't physical, he was spirit. It kind of reminds me of like some sort of something like uh, you know, Luke Skywalker would do, you know, project his being into it. No. Uh, and some people actually have, a, a, there have been thoughts over the years that that's what he did. Uh, they came to the conclusion during a you know, council that Jesus was fully man and fully God. Not 60, 30, not, you know, both. I always I often come back to that point. Both. Both are being used. This union of Christ. Uh, now, <clears throat> one, what I did is instead of just thinking what I think Jesus is, or what I think, or what the church thinks, or what history thinks, you know, uh, I decided to go through and look at verses where he talks about himself. So, I mean, to really get a picture of a guy, I mean, this is how he talks about himself. This is what he thinks about himself. And I, 
I did not put them all up there because I'm just going to look at a lot of verses quickly and move on. I didn't want to spend half an hour loading verses or wear anybody out. So not all of them will be online. If you've gone to church for any time at all, most of these you should have heard along the way. <clears throat> Luke 5, verse uh, 20. Uh, the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus, speaking of himself, the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. And the... the, the the argument at the time was only God can forgive sins. To which Jesus replied, the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Which means he can do something only God can do. Right? Why can God forgive sins? Because they're his laws you broke. That's why God can forgive your sins. It was his laws you broke. Uh, Matthew twelve eight: The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Sabbath set apart as a holy day, a day unto the Lord, a day to be reflected upon, a work to be ceased, and Lord to be focused on. And Jesus claims to be Lord even of the Sabbath. I will take a little detour. It, he says, Son of Man. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. This happens in the Bible, uh, a couple places, the, the phrase is used. If you look it up, one of the things that was just a common uh, Hebrew allegory translated in the Greek that just means like, you know, mankind or, you know, part of mankind, you know, son of man. You're, you're, one, of the, you're one of the humans. You're one of the, you know, you're one of the peeps. You know, you're, you're, you're part of the group. Um, I don't think Jesus was just saying me as a mere human, I'm in charge of everything or I can forgive sins. Me as a mere human, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I do think he was talking, though, uh, listen to Daniel. Remember the book of Daniel, written during the time of the Babylonian exile, you know, 500 and something years before Christ. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. I probably should have put this one in there. Did we put this one in there? Good. I like to see that. I don't have my little monitor anymore. I can't see what's going on behind me. I do miss my little, my little friend. Uh, of course, I needed the cable for something else. Uh, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, a name for God, and was led into his presence. It goes on. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Well, which kingdom has never been destroyed? Uh, really, none besides Jesus. And now, I'm not saying we, can, we have a sense of eternity, but we can say since he got started, his kingdom is still going. So as far as kingdoms go, he's the closest to eternity that we've ever seen here on, on this side of time and earth. What, who is this son of man pointing to here? One who's with God, who in the heavens and the clouds, who has the power... Uh, I think Jesus, when he talks about it, he means stuff like that. That's the son of man he's talking about, not just some regular, regular guy just like the rest of you, you know. Though in some ways he was, that human side of him. Uh, John 10, I and my Father are one. You know, is Jesus uh, here? Is he there? Is he lesser? Um, I said I've read on a, a Jehovah's Witness website, Jesus is the Savior, but he's not to be worshipped. Jesus is the Savior, but he's not to be worshipped. Only God is to be worshipped. Now, we read right here in his vision that this guy, this, this, this Son of Man, is worshipped in his vision. And he has a power and authority from God. So, I mean, I, I think it's just based on that, it's possible to worship somebody uh, in the same light, in the same way, and we do to this day. I and my Father are one. Now, this is a very famous passage. Uh, it's called the Great Commission. The Great Commission. And you often hear uh, parts of it, but uh, verse 18, Jesus says, Then Jesus came to me and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Somebody could argue, well, it was given to him. He's lesser than God. Okay. And you could also argue, and he has all the authority and power. And so now he's much more like God. You know, it's, it's well, which one is it? Well, it's both. It's both. He is, the God is the Father, He is the Son. And He is one with the Father. Both. 
verse 19. Yeah, therefore, you've heard this part. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right? Uh, all are very important in this particular passage. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Does he say everything God has commanded? No. He says, teach everything I have commanded, and surely I am always with you to the very end of the age. <clears throat> so, a few things to mention here besides the fact, this, this is often used in missionary work or church mission statements, you know. Uh, go out there and make disciples. But I don't want to highlight that part. I want to highlight the part where he has all authority in heaven and on earth, and we're to teach everything that he has commanded. His words, what Jesus has said. Uh, it goes on. Uh, in in, in uh, John 6, he says, I am the bread of life. Well, bread is certainly a staple of life. Has been for, you know, a, a man, a man, you know, uh, it says a man cannot live on bread alone, which is true. But a prisoner can live on bread and water for a very long time. It's enough to get you by for a long time. You don't look so great, but bread and water is enough to get you by for a while. Bread is life-giving. Uh, I think about that spiritual uh, bread that appeared during the wilderness, this manna that would appear. Uh, it would come down from, from heaven and, uh, and, and it would sustain them, nourish them. I think Jesus may mean all those things when he says, I am the bread of life. He also says, I am the light of the world, John 8. That might imply that the world is dark. And this is a, this is a part where if you've been around long enough and been kicked around long enough and had some things happen, you're not too hard. You don't have to argue too much about the first part. The world is a dark place. It is. I mean, there are crimes and the, what mankind does against another mankind. I think it's horrible when children hurt. I think it's horrible when senior citizens are scammed on the phones out of their life savings. You know, all, how, often does that, how often does someone try to do that to you? Almost every day. There's a text or a phone call trying to get your money uh, in their pockets as opposed to yours. Um, and it just goes on. The world is a dark place. So the first part of that, but then he adds, he's the light of the world. So in uh, light of all that, he is a shining light of the world. Not the country, not the people group, not just around Jerusalem, you know. Uh, we could have a, a, a movie star, you know, here, but it may not be as big in other countries, and vice versa. Their big movie stars aren't as big as, you know. He's saying the world. He thinks he is the light of the world. He thinks he is the bread of life. Again, we're looking at who Christ is. What does he say he is? These are the things he's saying. <clears throat> John 14, I am the door. He's a door. Well, of course, a door. There's a door there, there's a door there. A door has some purposes. It keeps certain things out. It helps keep certain things in. And that could be your toddler, your dog, you know, your heat, your air conditioning, whatever. You want to keep certain things in and you want to keep certain things out. Door is a wonderful thing. He's a door. A door to what? Well, I would argue uh, heaven, God, truth. Uh, he also can be in the way. He can stop you from getting in. Why? Because you don't follow him. You have your own set of rules and ideas and clues. Uh, he also, uh, so that was John 10, John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Right? The way, the path, you know, you're going you're gonna, to you gotta go somewhere, you've got to take a road, a path, there has to be some sort of a trail. Right? We'll get anywhere, you know. Uh, in fact, without those, you often walk in circles. When you, have, when you don't have a particular path to follow, and there's not a great, you know, jungles and forests and stuff like that. People will walk in circles without guidance. Well, he is the way. Truth. Now, we don't always like hearing the truth. But we certainly get upset when someone lies to us. Right? We do get upset when someone lies to us. And he is the truth. It's almost as if to say, what truth is, is me. What you might think is truth might be relative. But what he is the truth. Like if you look up in Webster's Dictionary... What's truth? It just says, see Jesus. He is the truth and the life that can apply both here and now and there and then. Eternal life. <clears throat> People always say, what should I do with my life? What is my purpose? Jesus talked about all sorts of things that fit in this category. Is there something more? Is there something bigger? Yes, 
Here it is, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. And then he adds, no one comes to the Father except by me. Talk about being a door. He is the entry point to the Father God. <clears throat> People say, you're not, not going to try to tell me that Jesus is the only way just because you like it. No, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, he said it. He said he's the only way. He said he is the, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Now, if you think he's a liar, well, live your life any way you want to. If you think you might have a clue, I'd look into it further if I were you. He says, I am a good shepherd. Uh, and I, I think of a barnyard critters fact. I think about like your backyard. Uh, uh, I was not raised in a, in a, I was raised in a city. I didn't get around horses and things and pigs and goats. and Who's got the pig? Uh, you got a, it has a house pig. It has a house pig. Uh, things like a, like a Greyhound bus. Um, <laughs> but it moves under its own power, so you got to give it that. Uh, and I, I, all these things are foreign to me when I visit your homes. I just didn't grow up with it, you know? Well, he says, I am the good shepherd. Well, shepherd does, I never was a shepherd, I didn't hang out with any shepherds. It's just not, you know, it's not an instant picture, you know? Uh, if you talk about cities or traffic lights or, you know, fire hydrants and sidewalks, you know, all these things come to mind from my childhood. But the barnyard critters, as I like to call them, all this stuff is foreign to me. Foreign to me. Well, uh, I've actually, during the course of ministry, I've looked up Shepherd several times. I've read, you know, the Shepherd's account of the 23rd Psalms, and uh, I've watched videos online. Uh, it was ghastly, some of the things I watched. It really was. It was, it was truly disturbing. Why? Because barnyard critters leak and they spill and, they, they, and they, they, uh, they have areas both front and back that are prone to infection or lice or disease. Or, and someone has to go around cleaning these things. You know, I like to think there's like a machine you could take your, your sheep or pig to and just have it do it. You know, you have to do it. There's all sorts of medical things that take place. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, it just goes on. I mean, what you have to do for horses sometimes is just, just I, I don't want to be there. I don't want to have to watch it. Uh, uh, I'm not making this up. I'm just telling you the truth. I just did not grow up with it. But he says, he's the good shepherd. What does that imply? Everything. What does a shepherd do? Well, it guides. Shepherd guides this flock. It protects the flock. Protects from what? All sorts of things. There can be uh, predator animals. There can be the sheep's own uh, foolishness, you know, walked into a, a, a bunch of thorns and thistles and can't get out because they're all you know, stuck to the thing, right? Uh, uh, all these things take place. And of course, uh, they're messy and someone has to clean that up too. Our lives can be very messy and Jesus is willing to clean that up too. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11. Now, almost everybody, I don't care what country, city, thing, you're going to wonder sometime during the course of your life, you know, what's next? When we die, we die, is that it? We're all, you know, you hit your peak in your late teens, early 20s, then that physically, and after that you just spend your years declining, sometimes slowly, sometimes faster. I often joke that the older I get, the ground gets further away. And whether it's me falling down, it seems like it takes a lot longer and hurts a lot more because it's like farther. Or trying to get back up off the ground. It seems like the up is a lot further away than it used to be. It takes a lot more effort to get there. You know? uh, all of us realize, wherever you're from, that time's you know, ticking away. What's next? He says he's the resurrection. He's what's next. He says he is the life. And that could be, again, like life eternal or meaning in this life now, direction in this life now, guidance in this life now. <clears throat> I've recently run across a couple of ministers uh, in my last travels uh, who took other paths in life early on. And I mean, we met that one person who was a heroin addict and homeless. Now a pastor of a church, it was you know, 15 years ago or more or whatever, but it just tells you some people can take some wrong turns. Most of us have family members who have taken wrong turns and continue to take wrong turns. And that could be, of course, the obvious things, which are alcohol and drugs. It could be other things like just picking the most possible mates available, 
They're positive it's Mr. Wonderful. Nobody else in the family is, and they have a miserable life afterwards. Uh, these things, and you'll see, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody, I'm not saying, but you'll see some people during the course of your life that seem to be very good at doing that. It's just a, you know, it's a different guy, but he sure acts like the last one. You know, it just, it just seems that way. You compare that, I speak from experience, I'm not quoting verses. Compare it to your own experiences. You, uh, again, yeah, uh, I am the vine and my father is the gardener. Well, I mean, again, I didn't do a lot of gardening growing up or farming or anything like that. But I do realize, uh, uh, in my own limited understanding, that a gardener takes care of business. What kind of business? All the business. That includes the preparation and the, the, the sowing of the seed, the planting, and the caretaking during the time of growth. That can include pruning, which is a whole other sermon uh, in, in and of itself. Uh, who, who pruning and watering and finally harvesting. And even once all that's said and done, there's preparation for next year and you know the year after and the year after and the year after. Uh, he says he's the vine, which of course is what the, the branches grow off of. He's the main stock, the root, the trunk. And his father is the gardener. Uh, he goes on to say, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, again, even in my limited understanding of gardening, I realize if you cut off a branch or a limb, it don't do so good by itself. It withers and dies. And that's what he's saying. Without him, you will wither and die. John 8 and for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. He's saying there are sins, and most of us agree. Again, everyone agrees there are sins. Now, we don't like to talk about our own, but we agree they're, they're out there. People do mean things. There's wrong things. We agree on that. Unless you believe that I am, and there's a whole thing about the I am statement. I am he or I am, depending on what translation you're reading. Because uh, that's the same thing when Moses came to the burning bush. And he's like, you're going to go into Egypt, let tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. He didn't sing it, but it's a song. And well, who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. And there's actually a whole study of how many times Jesus said, I am. You know, an interesting reference to that passage. Another sermon, another time. Uh, Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So there are sins, everyone agrees on that. The fact that they have a penalty, people like to argue. The fact that it could cause death. Uh, we, know, we agree that sins can cause death here in this life, but he might be talking a bit more in an eternal sense. <clears throat> John 8, so Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. And I mean... When you lift them up. Now, most people go, well, what exactly does that mean? But I think somebody with a knowledge of the Bible kind of realizes that might be the cross. Lifted up on the cross. And when he was lifted up on the cross, he cried out some different things. One was that, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabathani, or however it's pronounced. And it translates to, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And if you don't know your Bible well, you can say, gee, he was having a tough time. He's wondering where God's at. However, if you do know your Bibles a bit better, and of course I think a lot of people in his hearing would have known the Jewish Old Testament, that's Psalms 22. He's quoting the very first line, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then if you start reading Psalms 22, which was written down a thousand years before Christ, it sounds like some guy's getting crucified. It sounds like they pierce my hands and my feet. They're gambling after my clothing. All these things that took place during Jesus' crucifixion are being written about by King David a thousand years earlier. Like, like the songs being written from first-person crucifixion. Uh, and now look back at that verse we just read. Uh, when you've lifted the Son of Man, you will know that I am He and I do nothing on my own. When he was, and when you heard that, I mean, think about it. If your mind went back or you opened up your scrolls or whatever and you went back to Psalms 22 and started reading that, it'd be like... Wait a minute here. There's a lot going on. It's very similar to right now. You know, why would God have all this in here? You know, did we just crucify a, a Messiah? Did we just crucify one of God's servants, his prophets? 
spoken of in the Holy Scripture, you will know when you lift them up. And of course, in the hearts and lives of Christians, when you exalt Christ in your life, when He is the foremost, and He is the forefront, when He is all, you'll know He is the Son of God. I mean, it just it builds. It builds and it builds. I've, you know, there's a point, I've tried to explain this. I'm not saying you can't have doubts. I've certainly had doubts. I'm not saying that Christianity isn't a growth thing. You don't grow in faith. You don't grow in grace. You can't grow, you grow in love. You can do all those things in Christianity. Uh, but you do get to a point where faith goes to a point where this was a horrible hurdle. I had no idea I got, was going to get through it. And I did. And God was good. And this part of my life, I didn't think there was any way out. And, you know, and God was good. And I did. So then like the next time it happens, it just doesn't bother you so much. Why? Because God's taking care of everything else. My guess is he'll get me through this one or take me home or whatever else. Win-win. Win-win. Think about that. Uh, I, I always thought there was a famous uh, pastor uh, talking about his death. I forget his name right now. But it was on the lines of, uh, don't mourn for me when I die. For on that day I'll be more alive than I ever was here on earth. I mean, that's that, the hope and the faith. And, the, and it, it fixes things on this life. Things just don't bother you so much. They just don't shake you up as much. Uh, I, do, I do watch my Facebooks. And I do see people often bleeding out. This goes out to the person who cut me off in traffic. You're a, you're a meanie poopy head. And, you know, um, you know, is that person really going to know you're talking about them? Are they going to read and go, oh, my gosh, I'm so wrong. Let me contact you and apologize, you know. Well, I, they're, they're bleeding out. They're telling you. Know, uh, on and on, and someone was mean, and they got shortchanged, and their burger didn't have pickles. And you'll, this is on Facebook. This is on Facebook. Uh, and it just seems to really, it must be really affecting our life to put it on the web like that. I mean, it's, it's not just a little inconvenient. It's a, it's a major thing to let the world know, you know, I didn't get my pickles, right? It's a horrible thing, yeah. Uh, and just... When you have a faith in God that's working correctly, the stuff just doesn't bother you so much. It's like making life truly life uh, might be a way of saying it. Uh, John 5, listen to this one. Verily, you know, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Now we're going way back. I mean, there's a Garden of Eden, you know, there's a Noah thing, there's a bunch of kids, you know. And then pretty soon the story just picks up with Abraham. This is long before Moses. Abraham becoming the father of, a, of, 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 of eventually the, the, one of the patriarchs of the, of the Jewish tribe. Uh, Jewish tribes, clans, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and he says, I know who Abraham is. Before Abraham was, I am. There's that I am statement again. But Jesus was before Abraham. He's going back 1,500 years, 2,000 years, whatever the correct time. Actually, it's probably closer to 25, 2,000 years, 20,000 years. Uh, he's going back that far, saying he was already there. He's claiming to be far older than you know, Abraham. He existed in time before his appearance on earth. Well, he said something else in Luke, chapter 10, verse 18. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He's going way back now, and he saw it. He existed in time before his appearance. He was with God the Father. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you're any clue as to who the Word was in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus. Uh, that's impressive. He existed outside of what we consider to be regular time and, 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 and space and things like that. And then, in Luke 24, he says this. Talking about his uh, uh, crucifixion, resurrection, he goes on to explain, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, he doesn't mean specifically the law of Mo those were the ways of summing up the major books of the Bible, of the Old Testament. The law, the, the first five books of the thing, uh, the prophets all part of it, and poetry was the Psalms. All, not just the Psalms, but you know, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Job is technically Jewish poetry. So he's, summing, he's saying the Old Testament, 
everything that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now what's he said? That in your most holy writers, most holy book, throughout the entire thing, things have been written about me. And they must be fulfilled. And of course, we know it as all these verses are pointing towards a Messiah, a servant, a savior, a suffering servant. And it's all found and fulfilled in Christ. Uh, during yesterday's class, this, the point was made that, you know, uh, you may not hold your Bible in high esteem or read it that much. But there's certainly great reasons to hold it in high esteem. There's certainly great reasons to read it. I mean, how do you put all these references to Christ before he was ever born into a book and have them all come true? I say that's the fingerprint of God separating that book from almost any other you'll ever read. In fact, I think in the Quran there's one prophecy, uh, Muhammad will return to Mecca, is what I remember reading. Well, I'm, I might return to Reno. I mean, it's just not as big as getting up from the dead. A bit more impressive. I've quoted this before. I'm going to quote it again. It's the only thing I can think about when I read this type of material. Uh, you've, some of you have heard it, but for those at home or new people, a famous, from, a famous quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis uh, you know, was a writer of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Chronicles of Narnia, you know, type things, and other books. But he wrote a great deal on Christianity. He was voted the most influential lay theologian of the 20th century by some theological group, I forget who. Here's what he says in his book, Mere Christianity. And by mere, we don't want to talk, it's merely this. You know, we don't, we don't, he's talking about the basics, the substance, the, the core doctrines, if you will. And he says this, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying really foolish things that people often say about him, Christ. And they say things like, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. He says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus did would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up a fool, you can spit at him, you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Christ stands before you, high, and as we read these, high and lifted up and existing before time and eternal and powerful, and with all that going on, he wants to get to know you. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to commune with you. He wants you to follow him. Don't come up with any patronizing nonsense about this. He didn't intend you to. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, your word is empowering, overpowering. The words can jump off the page. Time seems to stand still when I read some of these things. True for many Christians. True for most. I ask you to be with those here today to remind them of the basics, who Jesus is. And for those who aren't sure, show yourselves to them. Bring them to you. May they know the fullness of life that is truly life and have purpose in this life beyond anything they ever planned. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.